Worldwide, the number of cases of COVID-19 has passed 100,000. COVID-19 is a global health crisis. COVID-19 can be characterised as a pandemic. We will be suspending all travel from Europe. Infection rates rocketing 50% in just 24 hours. The sick just keep on coming. 30 times higher death rate than seasonal flu. Concern is there could be tens of thousands of deaths. The health system cannot cope. Mass school closures will be required. The response has been drastic. Don't get on a cruise ship. There are two Australians with coronavirus on a cruise ship. This is a national emergency. All public gatherings and sports events are banned. Tokyo Disneyland is closed. The Dow taking its biggest point drop in history. We're talking about billions of dollars of loss. The first Australian politician to contract the virus. One of the greatest things is the fear. Supermarket shelves are rapidly emptying across Australia. <laughs> As Australia slowly loses its mind, I just want one panic. We behave like a herd of animals. Panic is one of the most contagious things on earth. Coronavirus, or COVID-19 to be specific, has prompted the greatest world health panic in a generation. Global hysteria. Entire countries in lockdown, stock markets in free fall, brawls in supermarkets. The only thing spreading faster than the virus is fear. So is all that hysteria justified? Tonight we'll sort the fact from the fiction and tell you the truth about the source, the spread and the cover-up. Wuhan in central China, normally a bustling commercial hub of 11 million people. But in the aftermath of the coronavirus outbreak, they're nowhere to be seen. Life is on hold at the centre of the outbreak. Streets are empty and eerily quiet since the entire city was placed into lockdown in January. This is one of the hospitals where patients are being treated. Exhausted medical staff are working long and gruelling hours. They wear protective suits and breathing apparatus. It's a microscopic virus, but it's causing a monumental crisis. So where did it come from? Chinese scientists believe this is ground zero for the outbreak. A market in Wuhan where wild and domestic animals are sold alongside meat, poultry and fish. China's Centre for Disease Control took samples from the market and linked the virus to the wild animal trade. The result shows that the bat is the most likely natural host of the virus. So what is this viral infection sweeping the globe? Dr Sanjaya Sananayaka is an infectious disease expert and associate professor at the Australian National University. Coronaviruses are a group of viruses that are found in animals. However, seven of them have jumped across to humans. Two of them you've probably heard of, SARS and MERS, uh, which have caused some serious outbreaks over the years. But four of them are responsible for about 20% of the common cold and have been recognised for around 50 years or so. COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, is about 80% genetically similar to the SARS virus. So it probably has a common ancestor in bats, which has found its way into an intermediate animal and mutated a bit and then managed to come into the human population. People started dying just two days after the virus was first identified and the World Health Organization was worried. What we understand from the 2019 novel coronavirus is that it can cause um, a range of disease in individuals who are infected from mild disease all the way to severe disease and death. 
that's quite a range. Um, investigations are still ongoing to, to better articulate what proportion of individuals will have mild disease or severe disease and what um, risk factors they may have to result in, in more significant disease. The problem with this virus is that it's new. None of us have ever had it before. So potentially, 8 billion of us are susceptible to it. And even if the complication rate, even if the death rate is low, if all of us can get it in large numbers, then a lot of people can get sick, and that's going to cause big problems with countries' health and other infrastructure. Infectious diseases expert and Sydney University professor Robert Boy believes the impact will be significant. A bad flu season might cause 3,000 deaths. The very best we could do in controlling corona would be three to 5,000 deaths, but the concern is there could be tens of thousands. Chinese officials tried to keep the outbreak quiet. All through January, social media lit up with claims of censorship by the communist government, and citizen journalists who reported on the outbreak disappeared. Video posted online showed non-infected people being dragged out of their homes and taken away as supposed patients after reporting on social media. International journalist and war correspondent Michael Ware says China has a poor track record of telling the truth. Obviously that's one of the problems that the global health community is facing. It has to be able to decipher the official reporting from China versus what unofficially may be happening. And quite frankly, there is no simple way for us to know. One of the first people to go public was Wuhan ophthalmologist Li Weng Liang. On December 30, the day before China alerted the World Health Organization, he sent a message to a group of colleagues about a possible outbreak. Days later, he was summoned by police and reprimanded for making false statements and disturbing the public order. He went back to work at the hospital, but a week later developed symptoms himself and died on February 6. He simply messaged all his medical school graduate friends from his year to say to be on the alert for this new disease. Then the Chinese government shuts him down. The next thing we know, he's in a hospital bed with coronavirus and then he dies. It's very hard to look behind the official numbers, in, particularly in authoritarian regimes. China downplayed the spread. Even after it crossed international borders, the director of the government's Wuhan Centre for Disease Prevention insisted the outbreak could be controlled. With the effective measures put in place, we can prevent and control the disease from spreading. China's evasiveness has led to many conspiracy theories, particularly about the source of the virus. US Senator Tom Cotton says China is lying. This virus did not originate in the Wuhan animal market. Epidemiologists who are widely respected from China who have published a study in the international journal The Lancet have demonstrated that several of the original cases did not have any contact with that food market. The virus went into that food market before it came out of that food market. He thinks it escaped from a lab. We also know that just a few miles away from that food market is China's only biosafety level four super laboratory that researches human infectious diseases. Now, we don't have evidence that this disease originated there, but because of China's du duplicity and dishonesty from the beginning, we need to at least ask the question to see what the evidence says. And China right now is not giving any evidence on that question at all. Another theory is that the virus is a leaked bioweapon, an experiment tested on animals which either escaped the lab or were sold to local street vendors after the experiments were over. In these circumstances, it's best to adopt a general rule about conspiracies. The conspiracy usually comes after a stuff up. And maybe there has been a stuff up from a lab, we don't know. We're probably never ever going to find out. Certainly won't be finding out from the Chinese. A novel written some 40 years ago, spoke about an outbreak just like this one. The Eyes of Darkness, 
published in 1981, described a virus produced in a lab just outside Wuhan as China's most important and dangerous new biological weapon in a decade. It's prompted frantic discussions online, but it is just a work of fiction. The symptoms and kill rate simply do not match. So why has this outbreak received so much attention? COVID-19 is highly contagious and has spread at an extraordinary speed, particularly in China, Iran and Italy. It took just 48 days to infect a thousand people. In contrast, the SARS outbreak in 2009 took more than four months to infect that many. And the 2012 outbreak of MERS took two and a half years. This virus, like other coronaviruses, spreads via respiratory droplets. So when people cough and sneeze, for instance, droplets carrying the virus fall quickly to the floor, usually within a metre or, or so of that event. And people who touch uh, contaminated surfaces or, cont or contaminated hands and then touch their own mouth, nose or eyes can get infected. The key symptoms to look out for are a cough and a fever. Just a snuffly nose is unlikely to be corona. It's a cough and a fever, and then maybe some increased work of breathing, shortness of breath, and then you may develop, after about a week, pneumonia, where you get pain on breathing and breathing fast and a high fever. And it spreads much faster than other illnesses. The coronavirus is spreading too fast. There is person-to-person -person transmission uh, all over Australia and the numbers are rising rapidly. Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy says there's a good reason it's spreading so quickly. The coronavirus has particular significance because it's a novel virus. We don't have a lot of background immunity and therefore it has the potential, as we've seen in these countries, to infect a lot of people at, at, at the one time. And we do know that potentially around 1% of people, we don't know the exact number, uh, can have a fatal outcome, particularly those who are elderly and frail. 1% might sound low, but if the number of cases surges, that toll will quickly add up. For influenza, every patient infects only one or one and a half other people. For COVID-19, it's two or three. That means even if the mortality rate is low, with so many cases, the death toll could still be very high. If through a lot of effort we can keep the infection rate from corona down to 20% of the Australian population, that's still 5 million. If the death rate was 1%, that would be 50,000. If we can keep the death rate down to 0.1%, that's only 5,000. As the virus spread, reaction in Australia quickly turned to panic. Panic then became hysteria. We heard from Coles today that they are now going to be limiting people to just one pack of toot paper as Australia slowly loses its mind about the wrong end of the body that is affected by the virus. I just want one pack. No, not one pack. When people faced the prospect of having to isolate themselves, a sort of mania broke out across the country. The strangest part was that toilet paper became the item Australians wanted to stockpile most. Shelves of toilet paper, pasta and canned goods were stripped bare, leading to extraordinary scenes in supermarkets. This virus is testing everyone's patience and it's unearthing aspects of our society that frankly and are pretty ugly. Now there's been people squabbling on public transport over a cough. <coughs> are you serious? Did you just cough at me? Daniel Lukovitz is a security expert and founder of Calamity Security. Panic is one of the most contagious things on earth. And if people see other people acting away, we revert to animal habits, we behave like a herd of animals. We can behave like a herd of animals and copy other people around us and do what they're doing without actually giving it any thought as to what are the implications of this. This herd behaviour might appear extreme, 
but the president of the Australian Psychological Society says it's a normal human response. When something serious happens like the coronavirus outbreak, most people want to take control of what they can in the scenario. So, of course, it makes sense that if you think you might be trapped indoors for a couple of weeks, um, that you would look to trying to restock your shelves and make sure you have enough. Now, clearly, some people, unfortunately, have taken that to a next level and we see some of the poor behaviour that we've seen lately. And this could just be the beginning. Well, in Australia, we seem to be still trying to uh, believe that this might not be coming, and so we're doing things on a bit of an ad hoc basis. What we should be looking at is uh, some big steps now to slow the spread of this so that when it arrives, we can deal with it within the health system. So mass school closures will be required, and they will be required soon. Despite the rapid spread, the World Health Organisation initially refused to declare a global emergency, much less a pandemic. Now is not the time. That's a bit too early to consider that this event is a public health emergency of international concern. It wasn't until two and a half months after the outbreak and 100,000 cases in more than 100 countries that a pandemic was finally declared. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It's a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. But while the World Health Organization dithered about the definition, the virus spread relentlessly and fast. I wish to personally thank you for your patience, understanding and cooperation. My parents are nervous just because of their age and because of the, my mother's asthma, but we feel very healthy and um, we're just praying that we weren't exposed. First, thousands of passengers on cruise ships, such as the Diamond Princess, were confined to their cabins, including hundreds of Australians. So you can see... There's mirrors there, that's not extra space, it's just a mirror. Makes it look bigger. There's die! And then round and round, there's our TV. And that's it, that's our cabin. Towns, then cities, then whole countries went into lockdown. It has now been announced by Italian authorities that the entire country has been put into lockdown. Tourist attractions across the globe were closed, including the Louvre in Paris and eventually Broadway and Disneyland in the United States. Venice, one of the busiest tourist spots in Italy, was a ghost town. And Milan, always bustling, was quiet and empty. When the Pope delivered Sunday prayers for the first time, he did it via a live stream. Global travel meant the virus was carried all over the world. And as a result, new outbreaks continued to emerge in new countries. Australia banned all travel from China, then Iran, then South Korea, then Italy. The US took more extreme measures. To keep new cases from entering our shores, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. The world's busiest airports, usually crowded, are virtually empty. International travel slowed down dramatically and the airline industry stalled. UK airline Flybe collapsed. It's all over, it's all gone, so... And Australian airlines are not immune. Qantas had to cut a quarter of its services. Uh, we are taking 25% of capacity out of our uh, international operation and 5% out of our domestic operation. Sport has become one of the biggest victims, as the NBA, NHL, National Baseball and Soccer Leagues in the US were suspended, while in Europe, football matches have either been cancelled or played to empty stadiums. While here in Australia, the Melbourne Formula One Grand Prix, which would usually attract 300,000 spectators, was cancelled. Sport is a wonderful thing that brings us all together, but also in these changing times around the world, we need to be very mindful of the input of the health authorities. 
With business and consumer confidence shrinking across the globe, investors rapidly sold. Financial markets tanked. Australia and the US suffered the biggest losses since the global financial crisis. The stock market today crashed and really crashed, even worse than before. Our financial system remains strong, our economy remains strong. This is a very different situation to what we saw through the GFC. In the United States, President Trump assured Americans he would protect them. To ensure that working Americans impacted by the virus can stay home without fear of financial hardship, I will soon be taking emergency action, which is unprecedented, to provide financial relief. This will be targeted for workers who are ill, quarantined, or caring for others due to coronavirus. The impact on the economy and the threat of an economic downturn has prompted massive stimulus packages. Prime Minister Scott Morrison delivered a rare address to the nation and pledged at least $17.6 billion to stop the economy from falling into recession. I want to assure you and your family tonight that while Australia cannot and is not immune from this virus, we are well prepared and we are well equipped to deal with it. And we do have a clear plan to see Australia through. That plan was put to the test very quickly. Just into the newsroom, Minister for Home Affairs Peter Dutton has been diagnosed as positive with coronavirus. And the Prime Minister has revealed a national cabinet will be established with every state and territory leader. We will be advising against uh, organised, uh, non-essential gatherings of persons of 500 people or greater. For the first time in more than a century, Sydney's Royal Easter show has been cancelled. An escalating crisis with so much still unknown. <laughs> Governments are now dealing with the immediate fallout. But what will Australia look like in the years after the coronavirus outbreak? According to some experts, the pandemic has changed our national psyche. There is no doubt that a nation-shaping event like the coronavirus outbreak really can and I think will change Australia, change the way Australians live and work. Uh, in fact, if you look at the way in which this has happened previously in similar kinds of events, Australia did change. If you look at the Great Depression, for example, the generation that went through the Great Depression carried the scars and the lessons of that experience for decades, in fact, even through to today. Demographer Bernard Salt believes COVID-19 will change our lives. The way we interact, the way we shop, even the way we build our homes. I mean, if you're going to have 64 rolls of toilet paper, where do you store them? You might have uh, larger refrigerators, uh, uh, larger freezers, perhaps store food storage places, perhaps accessed off the butler's uh, pantry. It's almost like the Australian home is being built like a fortress because we no longer trust the broader community, the state, to deliver water, to deliver power, for us to be able to get access to food. Psychologists say we need to prepare for the worst, but at the same time, stay calm. It's going to be an interesting winter potentially for a range of reasons and we've just been through an interesting summer. So I think that probably the learning first and foremost is to remember we're human and we're mortal and things go wrong. Crisis experts say the coronavirus outbreak could actually have a silver lining for Australia by prompting conversations about planning for all types of emergencies. A microscopic bug blasting us out of the blasé. An effective emergency plan covers all hazards, so it doesn't matter whether it's a viral outbreak or it's a terrorist incident or it's a bushfire or it's some other natural disaster. You're going to have supplies in the house, first aid kit, emergency evacuation plans, batteries, flashlights, a small supply of food, a small supply of water, just things to keep you going. And that will work across any emergency, so even if you were prepared for, say, coronavirus and that didn't eventuate and you didn't have to do anything, those things can actually stay on the shelf and can help you out the next time there's a major emergency. Now you could say that this is going to lead to a breakdown in mateship, that's one view. I actually think it's going to go the other way, that, that it's a human nature desire to trust, to actually work collaboratively. We're a tribal people at the end of the day. So I think that we will actually put greater faith in 
the local communities in family, extended family. So what's going to happen now? Infectious disease experts say this could drag on for months and get worse in winter. Or, like the Spanish flu, it might have multiple waves. Things might settle down before another surge in a few weeks or a few months. But there is one last possibility offering hope. There's the extraordinary thing about SARS, the other famous coronavirus. We had 8,000 cases between 2003 and 2004 that sort of captured the global imagination. But after that, it disappeared. We never have seen a single case of SARS since. An outcome the Prime Minister and the whole world is surely hoping for too. We'll get through this together, Australia. We all have a role to play. Employers, nurses, doctors, teachers, scientists, friends, family and neighbours. I know we'll all do our bit. Thank you for listening tonight and good night Australia.